Mr. President, may I start by thanking you for giving me the honor and weighty privilege of speaking in this chamber. I remember when I first met you in Bushwhackers nightclub in our home city of Worcester, and that was before we started at Oxford. And you asked me if I intended to get involved with the Oxford Union. I replied along the lines of, no, I'm not sure. It seems a bit like a den of snakes. <laughs> no comment on whether reality met my suspicions. But three years down the line, here I am, and I and so many others remain immensely proud of you and happy for you, for your presidency and your term card. This is my fourth term on the Union Committee. My third as Director of Research, and I'm most pleased to finally be able to speak in a debate on a topic which I'm so greatly intrigued and exercised by. Mr. President, as we have related to in previous conversations, in a debate on whether this House should reject the great man theory of history, that we might conduct this debate in a chamber modeled on the House of Commons where so many great men of past, present, and yes, future, have sought to leave their mark upon posterity. In a chamber where every speaker of whatever background, belief, or leaning has been looked down upon by statues of previous union titans such as Gladstone, Churchill, Heseltine. In an institution where the dispatch boxes we speak at were once loaned to Churchill, and where Gladstone's former cabinet table was gifted and now resides. In a place such as this, it is perhaps not lost on me that there might even exist a debate as to whether we can ever reject the great man theory of history. This theory is one which, as we've just heard, approaches the study of the past through the lens of great individuals who either shape or redirect the course of history by their actions or inactions. This is not the use of the word great to imply that they are esteemed, honorable, or inspirational, but actually great because of the size of their impact upon the world. Now one may hear that this is a masculine theory, which conveys only the predomination of male figures. One may also hear that this is a theory which is more suited to the fanciful imaginations of infantilized minds, obsessed with the heroics of glory, and the ideals of single prominent individuals bending the courses of history itself to their whims for the mere exertions of their own willpower. These points, whether you agree with them or not, do have much validity here. But I would say that these critiques do not make a sufficiently strong case to reject this theoretical approach. But before I turn to this, it falls upon me, Mr. President, to introduce to you the speakers for the proposition side. We have just heard very ably from the Chief of Staff, Abby Bacon, who is also a history and politics student at Brasenose. A very competent and valued member of the committee who has personally grown in stature, well, not physically, in a time here. <laughs> I do find it interesting that for a person who loves to power dress in committee meetings and boss others about, she finds herself opposing the idea that great individuals in positions of power and authority cannot shape institutions or wider history. It clearly must be one of the greatest examples of gaslighting that the union has recently seen. <laughs> Next, we will hear from Professor Sir Richard Evans, a much respected leading historian of the German Empire and of the Third Reich. Sir Richard has also written a biography of the late historian Eric Hobsbawm. Then we shall hear from the Secretary of the Union, Tom Elliott, who is a second year classic student at New College. I profess freely, I do not really know much about Tom, um, <laughs> but I do hear from multiple sources, himself included, that he considers himself as having uh, the fattest derriere out of the boys on committee. Um, the truth of that judgment I leave to the members of the house, but let's hope that his arguments tonight are not as thick as his posterior. <laughs> and finally, we shall hear from Mr. Ken Follett, a renowned author of historical fiction, covering periods and events such as the Second World War, the Cold War, and the 12th century anarchy. These are your guests, Mr. President, and they are, of course, most welcome. In dealing with this vexed question of the validity of the great man theory, perhaps we might start by asking, what lessons can we learn from the lives of the individuals? Try as we might, the actions and the free will of individuals throughout our history have affected greatly the course of history itself. One thinks entirely of Lord Stanley's moments of cautious calculation at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485 before joining Henry Tudor's army. One thinks of William Wilberforce in his long, long struggle 
to abolish first the slave trade and then slavery, accompanied and assisted by Lord Equiano and Ottawa Cuguano. One thinks proudly of Mary Seacole as much as of Florence Nightingale in improvements in medicine and healthcare that operated on the military battlefields of the Crimean War. Can one seriously doubt that the spirited contributions and actions of these individuals did not leave some mark on posterity? Somehow, we have to ask, are they actually providing a channel of light for the people of today to better understand that which has led us to the present, be it for good or evil? I certainly do not doubt, as we've heard, but often history is simply the study of individuals who happen to be in the right place at the right time. Often history means that the great tides of human progress and regression result in the elements of chance and luck playing their part. But history is not the study of alternate universes and stranger peoples. It is much the story of a running dialogue of continual insertion and reassertion of understandings as societies move backwards and forwards in an ever-evolving reassessment of what we may deem significant or worthy in our praise um, or of our scorn. So, the contribution of individuals cannot be overlooked nor minimized without perhaps falling into a state of mind which teeters on the brink of dismissiveness or even fatalism about the ability of human beings of great in, um, positions and of comparatively none to influence their surroundings and to decisively shape the course of events. The opposition to this debate motion do not insist, indeed it would be erroneous to, that the perspective of great individuals is the only valuable or worthy manner of analyzing or interpreting history. The contours of class, gender, race, and so much else besides have all too clearly shown us that history in its multiplex and diverse richness cannot simply be reduced to a willingly myopic singular perspective. I remember last term when the theorist John Mearsheimer came to speak to this very chamber and said to, her, to us all, all theories are merely simplifications of reality. Well, the great man theory is exactly that too. Of course, it was not just Churchill's inspiring rhetoric, Gladstone's all-consuming perseverance, Mary Seacole's defiant courage, the quiet, exhausted non-compliance of Rosa Parks, or the elevated wisdom of Nelson Mandela, which changed the course of history. Of course not. Machinery, religion, art, they have all equally played their part. In reading individual lives and contributions, we become aware of the complicated psychologies and life experiences that shaped their contemporary worldviews. We may also learn the sad reality that great individuals are rarely great humans. But as we reflect upon a world in which barriers of identity, geography, and fortress mentalities slowly subsides and falls away, the joy which I have personally of being a history and politics student here, from my background, of which I am inestimably proud, to even stand in this place means that we are for now the moment in which history has been perhaps leading up to. It is incumbent, incumbent upon us all, as so many of us are now attempting to do, to constantly expand history in all its meaning, to revise and update it so that our worldviews are challenged and in the process perhaps changed, perhaps reaffirmed. We commit a grievous error by separating ourselves entirely from yesteryear. And here I refer to the concluding comments of Kenneth Clark in his famed Civilization series, which has always inspired me. He said, I believe that in spite of the recent triumphs of science, men haven't changed much in the last 2,000 years. And in consequence, we must still try to learn from history. History is ourselves. We all know the sayings, the longer back you look, the further forward you will see, and you don't know where you're going from if you don't know where you've come from. These sayings have always spoken deeply to me, but perhaps in our analysis of the past, we may also observe that other great law of history. What goes up must come down. As our own short lifetimes furnish multiple examples of, Today's orthodoxies rapidly become tomorrow's heresies. Yesterday's idols become today's heroes and tomorrow's villains. Perhaps our history and our society should embrace not only moderation and touches of a gentle good humor, but humility too. If we reduce history to being simply about grand superstructures, faceless theories, and superhuman fatalisms, then what room do we leave for ourselves? The options that exist for many of us here and elsewhere to become great individuals, even if we are but footnotes in the history books. In this world of ever-darkening troubles and great difficulties, 
we in this chamber and far beyond it are going to have to be truly the best version of ourselves in order to see off the challenges that come from every corner. Perhaps in mentally preparing ourselves for the ordeals which shall in not too short a time confront us, we may pause and look back to the annals of the past, filled with human relatable characters not so entirely different from ourselves as we might suppose, and reflect, listen, and learn. History, after all, has a very funny way of making its clamorous voice heard in some way or form. A very great friend of mine has a saying which may apply to us all in the struggles of the future. The time is short. It is because I so strongly believe that there is so much yet still to learn from the lives of prominent individuals and their contributions to our world in all their complexities that I urge you to vote for the opposition tonight. Thank you.